Right, welcome everybody to the afternoon session with Damon Rushik that's going to speak to us about seeing real-time traffic problems without saying Brexit and so on. The um, um, first two talks, the um, talk by, by um, Harvey Newman about um, the, the Large Hadron Collider and the data issues, and then the talk by Richard Allen about crowd sensing of the earthquakes, I sort of felt, um, um, bang, there's all my content gone, <laughs> which I guess is, is great from the point of view of, of conference organization. It means that there are people I'd never heard of who are doing very closely related work. But on the other hand, it means I, I have to try and find something different to say. Um, but then luckily there was the, the talk by Edward Lee, the, the um, absolutely fascinating talk about real-time control. And so, so that made it clear to me that what I really ought to do is talk about polemic um, rather, than, rather than reconstruction. So I'm going to essentially position myself as the anti-Edward Lee um, and, and try and explain why I think that that approach is not what we need for, for at least a certain class of problems. Um, let me start with turning this on. Um, this is a book, The Cathedral in the Bazaar. Um, it's, um, it, it, it's a book from a completely different domain. I mean, it's a book about Linux and open source and how you program it by, by the author of Fetchmail, one of the um, standard utilities. He, he, wrote, he wrote this longish essay he, he, he wrote it about development models for how you build open source software. Um, specifically, he was interested in the contrast between what he called the cathedral style of development, which is how Emacs was built, versus the bazaar style, which is how Linux was built. The cathedral style is where you have a small group of people who, who build a perfect structure and then release it once they feel it's ready. That's how Emacs development has gone on. It's in version 24 or something by now, and it's, it's worked very well for Emacs. And he contrasted it to the bizarre model of development where it's a open development. Anyone can contribute. All of the development is shown incrementally as you go along. Um, his essay was specifically about alternate styles for developing open source software. But but the metaphor, cathedral versus bazaar, is so good that it took on a life of its own, like all good metaphors do. So here's a cathedral, here's a bazaar. Um, Apple, when, when, when they decide their new product is ready, they will release it and everyone will have the perfect thing in their hand. Um, I want to talk about cathedral and bazaar of data, as it applies specifically in my context to traffic problems. What have we heard about? We heard about the Large Hadron Collider. I think those pictures are very self-consciously made to mimic the rose windows. I think that one is from Lincoln Cathedral. So that was the first talk. This is a gigantically expensive, absolutely precision engineered system. Um, versus the bazaar, this is the, the collect data from the crowd, try and get your stuff out there, see if, see if people adopt it, cope with the noise, cope with the uncertainty. So that's, that's perhaps really what a more honest title for my talk would have been, at least the first stuff, Anecdotes from the Data Bazaar. I'm going to talk through several cases that we've seen of working with data that arises in traffic problems, and from that I will attempt to draw lessons about what I think, what I think we should be doing when we're handling this sort of data. Um, here's a, a just small experiment you can do, anyone who has a iPhone and Android can just download a, a sensor logging piece of software. So that's what I did. I started at home. I had uh, Android and an iPhone in my pocket. They, they were both top end models at the time they were bought, which is quite a while ago now. So they're roughly contemporary. And I walked around a few blocks and I collected GPS traces. And I've just drawn a line indicating all the, the readings I got. You can see when I'm inside, it's, it's jumping around. When I went into a bike shop here, I think it was, that jumped around. Um, I mean, it's great that we have this. Um, 
but just the traces on their own, they won't be terribly useful if I want to ask a question like how far did I walk? Each one of these dots is 10 meters apart. So you can, you can see the, the uncertainty. Um, it's not, not really tight enough if we want to use it to ask questions like which side of the street should the Uber driver come and pick me up on? If you're in a complicated city with one-way systems, that becomes quite a time-saving issue. Um, I guess a, another question from this, a meta question is, why is this so crummy when commercial GPS, by commercial GPS, I mean the stuff that, that farmers use, stuff that military uses, the stuff that ships use, that gets centimeter precision. So the satellites can give you centimeter precision. You can get receivers, which give you centimeter precision. And what we have in our phone is off by 20 meters. Um, there's one blindingly obvious answer, which is phones are much cheaper. Phones are cheaper. They get a lock faster. To get centimeter prison, you probably need to wait for a, a few hours. You, you may need to set up specialized equipment. And these are uh, uh, eye-wateringly expensive to get centimeter precision. So you don't want that in your phone. This is the, the first rule. Cheap and fast and noisy will get more widespread than precise and expensive. So that's one lesson. That's a very easy lesson to learn from this. But I, I wanted to, to dig in a bit further. Let's, let's, let's learn a bit more about this data. Um, when, when your phone reports its position, it reports a position estimate. And it also reports a uncertainty estimate. It, the uncertainty is measured in meters. Here I've drawn the uncertainty measurements from the uh, uh, Android in green and the iOS in red. Sorry, I'm, I'm afraid the colors keep on changing from side to side. Um, they're just plain are different. The, the, uh, the iPhone is, is completely confident in its, in its mistakes. The, the Android um, doesn't, doesn't pretend to be accurate, but, but at least it's giving something. So that's, anyway, the phones will tell you this. One thing that I got from looking at this is you look at this and you think to yourself, no way is that ever IID noise. I mean, you're used to Kalman filters and so on. You assume independent Gaussian noise. That is absolutely not Gaussian noise. So, so what am I seeing? If, if the noise isn't Gaussian, if the noise has all these correlations, what, what can I do with it if I want to do any cleaning up? Obviously, that means I can't use Kalman filtering because it doesn't work there. Um, I, I, I did some experiments. My, my best guess for what, what this is doing, what I'm showing here, the iOS reading is, is in red again. And on top of that, I did a Kalman filter. And I did a Kalman filter in which the state which you're updating is location, comma, velocity. And for my Kalman filter, I assume that the velocity has IID increments. So I tried a variety of different Kalman filters. You could say, let state be location and assume that state has IID increments. That doesn't fit this very well. You could try this. You could try alternative models. Um, in, in fact, the iPhone operating system, it, 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 it gives you a choice of four profiles about how you want location reported. And this is just the high precision profile, which is different from the driving profile. Who knows what, what they are? It's not really documented. But anyway, after having tried a variety of different uh, uh, equations, Kelman estimating equations. This is my best guess about what's going on. It seems to fit roughly what the data is doing. That, that sort of, this is a reasonably sensible filter. It, it, it's, it's pretty good at keeping up to date with where you are. It's very laggy if you make a sharp turn. It, it, it sort of has the feeling of skidding when you go around the corners because it assumes that velocity has IED increments. And if, if you suddenly make a sharp turn, that, that doesn't fit its model. But anyway. The, the thing to take away from this is that the iOS is not reporting to you a sensor reading. It is reporting to you a preprocessed sensor reading. And no one will ever tell you what the preprocessing is. Um, here's another experiment I did. I was sitting in my flat around about here. And I sat there and had them both on for 12 minutes. And I recorded all the GPS samples, I think, frequency once every 10 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever it was. And um, here I'm just plotting longitude, reported longitude. The full x-axis is a range of 30 meters. And this is a histogram of the longitude readings that the Android gave. And 
this is a histogram of longitude readings that iOS gave. So what do you conclude from this? Well, you might conclude iOS has really zoomed in and narrowed me down very precisely. That would be just wrong. <laughs> GPS does not give you answers this accurate when you're inside. The answer is that iOS decided it would be more helpful to lock onto a single value and keep on reporting that value even though it's wrong than it would be to report the messy truth. So that's another lesson. A, a convenient falsehood, Apple thinks, is more useful than the messy truth. Um, Question. And when you say by truth, that means it's just the revealing that, you, that it isn't actually capable of determining where you are. Yes, the truth is best known by the device, exactly right. I mean, I get, yes, it would be nicest to have an oracle, but, but um, yeah, thanks. Um, so which of these two is better? I, I, I don't know if that's something you can answer objectively, but, but it is at least clear why Apple decided to do this. And Apple, let me go back to the Cathedral and the Bazaar, the original essay. This is a quote from, from Eric Raymond. There have been many other software products that combined a cathedral mode core and a bizarre mode toolbox. He was thinking of Lisp, where the, of Emacs, where the central editor is, is, is highly controlled and there's a whole load of Lisp packages which are distributed. The action, the ferment, the innovation mostly takes place in the open part of the tool where a large and varied community can tinker with it. He was also thinking of MATLAB there, um, but, but it applies just as well to, to iOS. Apple made a decision that they will have a cathedral mode core and they will do everything they can to nurture a development co developer community for writing apps. And so they make certain judgments about what will help nurture that developer community. One, one judgment, as I said, is they think it will be easier for app writers to flourish if they give them a, a clean falsehood rather than messy truth. Um, they, they, another reason behind the Kalman filtering, which I think is quite clever, Apple does Kalman filtering before it gives you any answer. Therefore, there is no point in me writing an app which will probe the GPS every two seconds. I mean, it's already been smoothed. I'm not going to get any extra information by repeatedly probing. Therefore, Apple, by pre-processing, has removed any incentive for me to repeatedly probe the hardware, and therefore, apps will tend to have better, better battery life. I think that was quite clever of them. <laughs> um, Apple does go to extraordinary lengths to make it easy for developers to get things right. The other thing that, that Apple did, they, they, they seem to have two modes. One is the Kalman filtering mode. The other mode is the latching on mode. Um, and um, Apple, I, I think, is positioning this because they say, OK, in, in two years' time, the phones could well have radically different hardware, and there will be new tricks invented along the way. I'm going to present a, a very simple interface which only reports position, and I'm not going to give any promises about what it does, so that when phones upgrade, hopefully the apps will not have, have been customized so much that they really use uh, uh, processing hard-coded towards the specific hardware. So, so Apple also thought, to make it resilient to the future, we want to obfuscate the signal. So those are the first two lessons. Cheap, noisy, fast, beats out precise and expensive. Um, it's why phones have, have crummy GPS hardware. It's why that, that um, smart shake system could get, has the potential to get readings from earthquakes in Nepal, whereas uh, the expensive seismographs won't. Second rule, data has been processed and no one will tell you how. <coughs> um, OK, let's switch, switch to a different example now. This is something that Pelagi touched on, um, and I want to go through this example a bit more because it's, it's nice and it also illustrates certain <coughs> points. Um, this is from a subway system. I called it the Baker Loo line. It's not actually in London. It's not actually in Singapore. Um, and I'm not going to say where it is. <laughs> but what I've drawn here is several stations along the line. I've given them their names, Baker Loo, Great Portland Street, Euston King's Cross, the you know, London names and time of day. And I chunked time into 15 second chunks. And I recorded the number of people who tap in or out at each station. And this is obviously a busier station, but there's not very much to see. OK, so let, let's try something a little bit cleverer with this data. 
In this version, I'm drawing the same data, but I'm drawing tap-ins above the line, and I'm drawing tap-outs below the line. Tap-ins, you'd expect people would arrive as some random process, like a Poisson process. Tap-outs, you would expect there to be spikes of tap-outs every time a train arrives. A train arrives, lots of people disembark at the same time, that gives a spike. Sometimes the spikes look reasonably clear, sometimes not quite clear enough. So that was the next trick that, that Pelagi mentioned. You look at the routes. What I did here is I looked at the entire route diagram and then based on the start location and the end location, I can make a, a pretty good guess. Did this person definitely take the line I'm interested in or did they arrive at the station from some other, uh, on some other line? And if I narrow my attention down to definite swipe outs on a specific line, then suddenly we start seeing these, these clusters very sharply. And then you can stitch them together and you can say, well, the passage, a train arrived here shortly beforehand, the train arrived here shortly beforehand, the train arrived here. So you can just stitch these together and you work out exactly where the train was. So this is, this is the reconstruction stuff that we heard about from first from, from um, in, in the Large Hadron Collider context, then from Bellagio this morning. Okay, so that's reconstruction, but that's not, that's not the point of this data, of, of this story. The point of this story is, this is us trying to work out where the trains are based on the tap-in, tap-out records. Um, why, why, why bother? <laughs> uh, surely they have systems which record where the trains are. Surely you could just go and interrogate a database and it'd tell us where the trains are. When we did that, this is the picture that we got. So, so here we actually received the recordings the, the, from their the, the signaling software of, of when the trains arrived at each station. I've drawn, so these diagonal lines going up represent a train in the outbound direction. This represents a train on the inbound direction along this line. Their the official timings mostly match the clusters of tap, of tap outs but not entirely. There are some just plain glitches in the data. When I looked at the data more closely, I, I did see quite a few cases where there were just bizarre glitches towards the end of the line. What I think was going on there was that they have performance targets and they measure the performance targets by asking what percentage of trains arrived at the destination <coughs> within a certain time of, of, of starting out. And it, if you have a train which is running late and you want to meet your performance target, what you do is you relabel your train <laughs> so it doesn't appear in the data set as a delayed train. <laughs> that's my guess. So anyway, that's why I'm not going to tell you which, which, which country this data came from. It's not from Singapore. It's not from Washington. It's not from anyone who paid us. I, uh, I'm going to tell you that much. Um, so what do we learn from this? One problem is that the data they tell us, the data they tell you will, people, people lie in their data. They don't tell you what's in their data. Sometimes they don't know, sometimes they're lying to you. Um, the other problem, to actually get them to tell us this train data took an awful lot of work. They have a system which was built goodness knows when, you know, whenever people built subway systems. Um, they have legacy systems. It, it, they said it took them to query the uh, platform times on a single platform, sorry, to query the train times on a single platform, they had to query it in chunks of half an hour on a platform by platform basis and then receive a huge number of files and then stitch them together. So whenever you try and get useful data about this sort of thing, you're tangled up with legacy systems. This was a story. The kind of data, couldn't you, someone send eight people out at 7 a.m. and stay around for an hour or two and, and get this? I'm trying to understand why it's so hard to get this data it's like you it's could. easier to ask the company than to kind of go out to the station. You could. It just costs people to go and, and, yeah. and stand there and get the train timings. So typically they'd send out people with clipboards to get the timings or they'd get the passenger counts and they'd do this as a sample because it's too expensive to do it continuously. So they'd take a sample once uh, periodically. But legacy systems, when, when, even when there is data, this is a news story from NPR, which, which was pointing out that the US nuclear weapons launch system still runs on 1970s computers with eight inch floppies. So, so all sorts of data is hidden away in systems like that. Okay, so, so lesson one, 
The reason why we were able to do the reconstruction based on tap-in, tap-out records is tap-in, tap-out is directly related to billing. You can be confident that any data system which is directly connected to billing will have very high quality data. Any data system which is not directly related to billing, you will have to cope with legacy and stuff and noise and nonsense. Um, let me give another example of something funny to do with billing. This is an example from Illinois Tollway. Um, they have a system of, well, they run the tollway. At each of these plazas, they have an overhead gantry like this. It's not like when you're coming south on, on the Golden Gate Bridge where, where the, the thing widens and you go through separate lanes, each with its own uh, uh, thing. They, they, they put the gantries over the entire street. And as you drive past, it scans your RFID thing. So ideally, you don't slow down at all. You just drive through, and it measures what's going on. These gantries scan your RFID tags in the car, and they collect your vehicle ID and the speed and the time at which you passed each plaza. Um, I, I jumped into the data for Plaza 35. Um, I did one of these classic. This is a graph where it's got through, throughput on the x-axis, flow on the x-axis, and speed on the y-axis. And I've drawn a line. There's a dot at every 15-minute point in time, and I've labeled them. So it, at um, there's 4 p.m., 4.15, 4 4.30, 5, and so on. Around about 4.15, there's a massive drop in speed. Um, I wanted to look in more, so um, let me switch to an animation. it playing and talk you through what I've done here. There's Plaza 35. That's the point where we have speed and timestamp records. I've drawn one dot per car, and I've given each car, well, there are cars in blue, buses in green, freight vehicles in red. <coughs> each dot represents a vehicle, and I've given it a tail, which extends back uh, one minute. In It it it's covers all the distance that that vehicle traveled in one minute. This, this representation has the happy um, behavior that um, if you just add up the total amount of ink in a vertical slice, it will tell you the throughput at that spot in time. So I don't have to do any bothersome bin stuff into 50 minute chunks, bin stuff into 100 meter areas. I just get instantaneous readings of, of, of um, throughput in vehicles per minute at each point along the path. At the top, it's telling us the speed, the average speed of the vehicles in the display, around about 60, 65 miles an hour. And I drew, drew a reference line. It's no formal reference line. It's just somewhere at R. Now we see it. How many Let's just legs? play that once more. Right. Happy, 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 60 miles an hour. How many legs? I don't know. I think it's four lanes. Now, this is what the onset of congestion looks like. Speed drops to 20 miles an hour. That's what congestion looks like. What, what, what's interesting here, though, is that um, if you look at the throughput lines before and after, this is just a reference line to keep your eyes level. At the time of congestion, there are these waves. But the average throughput has barely been affected at all. Um, I don't know enough about the, the transport dynamics. I, I, I know that when uh, uh, speed changes and, and density changes, I expect throughput to change. Throughput has barely changed at all in this. This is a phenomenon of massive reduction of speed, no real reduction in throughput. Anyway, that's a nice little demo of, of what congestion looks like.
Um, this phenomenon of, of large drop in speed, negligible drop in throughput. Um, let me get at it another way. At those times of congestion or in that nasty period of day, it, it, it's got onset around 4 p.m. It clears up sometime around 8 p.m. I was looking at speeds around Plaza 35 and, and speed at Plaza 35 really, really suffered. It went down to 20 miles or so. But we also have multiple readings at multiple points. So you can look at this travel time from here to here and you can ask what's their average speed. And the answer is the average speed between plazas is in the region of 60 miles an hour. The average speed is barely affected. So speed, but then these plazas, the plazas were designed not to slow you down at all. How can it be that, that this system is sampling at a stationary point along the road and getting an unrepresentative reading? Um, my, my best guess is that it's something along these lines that they've tried to make it so that this monitoring is unintrusive. But what actually happens is that there'll be 4% of vehicles who don't have RFID and they have to uh, uh, go to an exit lane, go into the cash booth, and then they have to merge back on. So that merging in and out uh, causes the shockwaves which cause slowdown and then the shockwaves have some extent, and the extent varies over the course of the day. The, the, this, this period of perturbation will be, you know, it, it kicks in at a certain time of day, 4 p.m., 5 p.m., some days it doesn't kick in. And then it's like if you have an army marching along, they're going along silly, and then they walk into treacle, and then they march along normal speed again. So, so there's no real impact on throughput, but there is a, a big hit on speed at those, those times of day. That's my best guess from the data. Sorry, so, so. Is the stock go away so then they go backwards? So then, so then you would kind of hit it at 35, but then move the wave would go backwards. Well, so I'm, I'm guessing that people are merging in and it's got some knock on effect forwards, and then, as you say, the shock waves are heading backwards. So that's why I, I, I drew this line going backwards, because I'm imagining there are shock waves pushing back. I, I don't know. The trouble is, this is a, a non measurable thing now. <laughs> we only have measurements at this instant. So, so um, how, how, how can you stitch together? This is just, just um, best guess based on piecing together those pieces of information. Anyway, this is, this is a, a example which really stresses this point. Billing data is the only data that is meticulously collected. Sometimes it is collected so meticulously that it destroys the system that you're, <laughs> you're measuring. Um, and then the fourth rule of the data bizarre. If you build a desirable platform, you get much richer data. So now I want to give a, a, a next example, last example, um, based on the, the incentive platform. Um, this is something that, that Balaji touched on. When a user signed up to the incentive, sorry, when a user signs up to the incentive scheme, um, they, they sign something which says, okay, we are now going to grant you uh, uh, access to historical trip records, records from before you signed up. Um, so for all the users, we have, what, 300 and something thousand users, and we have very, very long records for, for a lot of them. Um, what, what really the topic of this incentive scheme is, is how can you get people to shift their behavior? Um, there are some types of shift which are steady pressure. And there are some types of shift which are catch people at the key moment when they're ready to be persuaded. Um, there, there is, um, there's pop psychology literature about habit formation. I didn't know where to look for scientific stuff about habit formation, but if you're designing an incentive scheme, that's truly the best place to be. Get them at the point where they're on the verge of changing their habits target them with a lot of nudging then, and then hopefully you'll have won them for, for a period of time. Or it could go the other way. If there's someone who's, who's had reasonably good behavior and they're about to experience something very bad which will put them off, off public transit for the next however long, that's the point where you really need to worry about them. Um, what I'm going to describe here is, is a pretty brain dead model, but it's something which tells us something interesting. This is something that was done by an intern several a couple of years ago. Here's what he did. He said, 
I'll call it NUT, be the number of workdays, Monday to Friday in a given week, on which the user U made a morning trip. So our incentive scheme was targeted around trying to reduce the peak congestion in the, in the morning rush hour. So, so that's why I'm only looking at the morning. And let's just, just stick in the, the most brain dead model we can possibly imagine, which has some element of stickiness. So I'm going to fit the model, let NUT be alpha U plus beta U, NUT minus one plus, plus a, 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 a noise. So if I'm a user who's really habitual, and I always do the same this week as I did last week, then I would expect B to U to be pretty close to one. And if I'm a user who every week is its own new challenge, then I'd expect B to U to be pretty much zero. So these parameters alpha and beta are the most brain dead way we can get to get the first cut of, of stickiness in user behavior. I, I, I've said brain dead several times. What I really mean is this is a statistical model. It's trying to be a fit to extract some parameters of interest. It's not a generative model. It's nothing like you'd use if you're writing a simulator, but it's, it's good for descriptive purposes, not generative purposes. Um, so for each, I plotted one dot for each user, each of the 300,000 users. Alpha for each user is on the x-axis and beta is on the y-axis. And there are quite a few people with this beta pretty high. And if I pick a sample of these people up here, if I pick a sample of the users with a high beta, i.e. with strong, that they get stuck in a rut, I just picked out a group of people with high values of beta and I plotted a sample of them. Um, each panel here is a different user. The x-axis spans a period of about three years and the y-axis so each, each tick on the x-axis is one week, and the y-axis is the number of, uh, 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 number of days each week that they may do a commute in. There's an awful lot of this sort of behavior. You have a stretch, this is about three months, where you're doing four or five trips a week, and then you go off it, and then you go on it. That's another one, off, uh, on, off public transport, on, off, on. Um, what, what I really love about this is that when, when you look up in the transport modeling literature, there's an awful lot of stuff about discrete choice models. The standard discrete choice model is basically a one-shot model. You have some sort of logistic regression which says, based on this person's characteristic, the probability they will take public transport is P1, the probability they take a car is P2, and so on. And there are formulae for working out P1, P2, based on things like age, job, distance to work. Those are one-shot models, and those are great for generating independent samples each time of day. But if you're someone who's interested in changing what people do, you care about longitudinal models, and you really care about, well, so this is, this is the very first peak into longitudinal models. I think the reason why transport modelers don't even consider things like this is the way they collect their data is they, they do a survey. Every five years, you'd send out a survey. You'd collect data for one or two days. You get that. And if you have isolated snapshot data, all you can possibly build is an isolated snapshot model. But if you're in the data bazaar where you have built a platform which enables you to connect massive longitudinal data sets, that's what enables you to, to learn long-term patterns of behavior. It gives you access to much, much richer data. OK, so, so that's next two lessons from the Data Bazaar. Lesson three was that billing records are kept very carefully. Everything else, you have to work at it. And the final lesson was that if you build a platform, or if you're engaged in the building of a platform, and if you make the platform desirable to users, then you will get way more rich, interesting data and have the ability to tweak the rules to, to, to learn, learn much more. So let me, um, in the next. I've got 10 minutes left. I've talked about some of the challenges of working with data in the bazaar. Um, I'll, I'll finish by talking about what sort of tools we want to have to work with this sort of data. Um, a, a number of us, certainly me, used to be one of the priests in the cathedral who sits there. Uh, just to, we discussed the, the gaps about the living in the bus system. One of the things you know, we've talked that they had like just horrible commuting experience with trains. We might have gone to the bus. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the data to disambiguate from it all. Yeah. 
It could be they switched the bus. I know that when I was in London, I'd do that. I'd, in retrospect, I can't really figure out why it is that I'd take the tube for, for a month at a stretch and then suddenly start taking the bus. I, I just can't figure out why I did it. Um, then I'd switch to taking the bike for, for a long time. <laughs> okay, so I certainly used to be one of these people, the, the priests of the cathedral who sit there proving limit theorems. Um, but the people who work in the bazaar, uh, right, w w what I'm really keen on, what, what, what I've wanted to build is basically um, an Excel for big data. Excel is one of the most amazing modeling tools, but we don't sit around and have conferences about how you're using Excel to model it. <laughs> it just, just looks stupid. People who have actual problems of their own, they go and use Excel and they, they solve the modeling problems. And yet, yet somehow the, the tools for working with big data to understand these things are not accessible enough, not accessible to the same sort of people who could use Excel. So I want to highlight some features which I think will push towards that direction. So what I am very, very keen on is modeling done by domain experts, not, not modeling done by theoreticians, but theoreticians creating appropriate tools that domain experts can use, because domain experts are the ones who understand the ins and outs, the nitty gritty stuff of the system. They want crude answers to richer questions than you can get from theorems. When you're trying to work with theorems, you come to a certain point and say, oh, I can't prove a theorem here, so let's use simulation. Um, but then why not just give simulation tools to everyone? OK, let me, let me be a bit more concrete. Let me, let me say briefly what I think some high points were. 1990s is when GLM came on board. And all of a sudden, you have this, this language, this really expressive formula language, which lets you write out a modeling formula using only the variables in your data, i.e. the variables which you have created yourself. And by small permutations of the formula you write out, you can express really rich ideas. That was a, a massive leap forward, making those sorts of things accessible to everyday users. In, in the 2000s, that's when Bootstrap became computationally feasible, and it's when good visualization theory came on board, leading to good visualization packages, particularly D3 and ggplot. So that's, that's, that's the past. Um, the, the present, big data machine learning reconstruction. We've heard a fair bit about reconstruction now, so, so I won't, won't repeat that. But let me draw a quick picture of big data and machine learning as applied to control problems. Um, this is a picture of, a, of a, what you do if you were thinking of a control problem, but you didn't believe that Kalman filtering was appropriate. State variable xt, which updates itself, control variables which come in, and observations which come out. But let's think of this as just some arbitrary complicated neural network which we want to train from the data. So what I'm saying here is that I'm interested in really understanding what makes users shift their behavior. I have no confidence whatsoever that I could come up with any equations to describe it. So instead I'll throw it open to the neural network to learn the patterns. And if I have loads and loads of data, then these things will be able to learn something useful. And what these neural networks, when they're trained properly, will end up encoding is how much history needs to be kept from one time step to another, um, where, where habituation lives, all these sorts of things. Bootstrap was basically a way of trying to wean people away from using parametric equations, saying, don't use parametric models, just use the data as it is. This is, this is a model, so it's not quite it's, it's not completely non-parametric, but neural networks have so many parameters that you can't possibly interpret them. So if we as modelers have finally given up our attachment to parametric models, then, then this is, is an easy fit. Um, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this. There are, there are um, papers around, and I think, I think the techniques for solving these things, training them, are, are just beginning to be available. Um, so that's what, that's what the present looks like, or the near future. Um, and what I'm most excited about for what comes next, I write, call it causal inference and bootstrap simulation. Um, there was a, I can't remember the question. There was a question earlier today, but I've forgotten who asked it. So, right, sorry, I'll just skip over that. What do I mean by causal inference? Um, Rather than trying to define it, I'm going to give an example. 
This is the game that Balaji showed you. Um, each user has a piece on the board, and when you have earned enough points through your travel, you click on the spinner, and the spinner stops, and your piece moves forwards. So now, let's take the entire data set of everyone, and let's look at all the people who happen to be at this spot. Out of those people, two, uh, one sixth of them will hit this piece because they're roller two, and five sixths of them will not hit that hit that prize money. So therefore, what I have here, if I look at that subset of data and I make some fairly reasonable assumptions about time dependence, I have a mini randomized controlled experiment sitting there inside my data. And there was a question in Bludgey's talk where, where someone said, can you do randomized experiments? Could you like si let people sign up but then not really sign them up? It, you can do all sorts of things. Um, sometimes when people get wind of it, like when, when you learn that Amazon is giving you higher prices than other people, you, you feel miffed by it. So, so when you're doing these experiments, sometimes you, you, you try and introduce them subtly. Sometimes you take advantage of the natural variation that there is inside the system. This is, economists call this a natural experiment. A natural experiment is one where you have a mini randomized trial just embedded in the data you have. So this user got a three the user missed out, they're in the non-winning arm. So we know that spins are truly exogenously random. They're many randomized trials. They control how much a user wins. So it's this knowledge which gives us the causal link which says if you win, then you will do such and such. We can, we can treat this as a, as a genuine stimulus. And it's, it's these causal links that become the basis for a generative model, that become the basis for a simulation tool. So what I think the, the future looks like is we'll be collecting these massive fine-grained longitudinal data sets. They have to be fine-grained, I think, because otherwise these sorts of automated techniques about discovering many randomized trials, they just don't work if they're, if they're aggregates and they don't work if, work if you have snapshots of the data. So we need huge, huge data sets. The modeler will do the sort, same sort of thing they did with the GLM tools. You write some broad structural thing saying, I, the modeler, assert that this is a random thing within, within the data set. And then the machine goes away and, and it figures out the generative dynamics of the system in a, in a bootstrappy sort of way. It, it figures out, well, if I wanted to run a simulation, I could, I could bootstrap it by taking a collection of traces from other users who experienced the similar condition and, and, and build those up to form a simulator. So that's what, I think, that's what I think the next big things will be, is, is, is using big data to, to make modeling accessible to people who want to just answer trickier, more practical, more immediate questions. Um, I'll finish with um, one last slide. Um, uh, Stephen Boyd on Monday used the phrase that he said, people want engineering that starts from nothing and just works. Edward Lee gave the example of Boeing, where you just, I mean, would you trust a neural network to fly a plane for you? Would you get on a plane which was trained in the, in the way I've described based on simulation and neural network? Um, another counter to that is to say, there's no way this could ever fly, because it simply doesn't have anywhere near the real-time control bounds needed to make something truly fly reliably. So <laughs> if, if we believe Edward Lee, this will never fly. Um, I, think, I think that um, societal networks just need this kind of engineering. They need engineering which is great at coping with noise, great at coping with richness, and great at letting people try things out for themselves without, without getting hum, hung up in, in theorems or rigor or tightness, just, just you know, try something. And if it doesn't work, then you build your system a bit differently and you, you gather more data. Okay, thank you.